Hi, this is Dr. Vidya Krishnan. I'm going to talk to you today about the zones of the lung. This is a conceptual zone of the lung, not necessarily actual anatomic delineations of the lung, but it's going to be a concept we use to determine how gravity affects the lung. These zones of the lung are often referred to the zones of West. They were named after John B. West, a giant in the field of pulmonary physiology. He first published his book, Respiratory Physiology, The Essentials, that I'm sure you're all familiar with in 1974. But what you may not know is that he wasn't the first to describe this idea. Dr. Salbert Permit, who was one of my mentors, actually published the concept of the stalling resistor model describing the vascular waterfall back in 1960, 14 years before Dr. West. That's why you might hear me call it the zones of Permit. To fully describe and understand the zones of the lung, you really have to understand four simple concepts. The first is Ohm's law. Second is Poiseuille's law. Yes, that's actually how you pronounce it. Three is the Starling resistor. And four is gravity. Let's start with Ohm's law. There's often some confusion about the terminology that we use here. Ohm's law refers to a circuitry physics concept in which the flow across the resistor is determined by the differential in voltage from the beginning to the end of the resistor. In fluid mechanics, this same law is actually called Poiseuille's law, just to confuse us. But here in pulmonary physiology, we're going to call it Ohm's law just to differentiate between the two. The concept is simple and it's the same. In a rigid tube, the flow through that rigid tube is going to be determined by a pressure differential between the beginning and the end of the tube. And that is a concept that you can use in fluid mechanics, as in blood flow, or air mechanics, as in air flow. We use them both in pulmonary physiology. Flow through a rigid tube can also be described by the actual characteristics of the tube and the material flowing through. And this is described by Poiseuille's law. What we're seeing here is that the flow across the tube is determined by the radius to the fourth power and inversely proportional to the viscosity of the fluid and the length of the tube. What I really want to stress here is how important that radius of the tube is and that a simple decrease in the radius of the tube will result in significant decreases in the flow through that same tubing. Both Ohm's law and Poiseuille's law have certain assumptions underlying the models. First, they assume that it's a rigid tube and that there is a fixed diameter of the tube, and that the tube is non-distensible and non-collapsible. You can see how, when we're talking about blood vessels, this may not be an accurate description. They also assume a homogeneous fluid, not the serum and blood cells that we see flowing through the blood vessels we're describing here as well. So these models, the Ohm's law and Poiseuille's law, don't fully describe the blood flow through blood vessels. So clearly we know that blood vessels have the ability to expand and contract. The Starling resistor model, which is what was described by Dr. West and Dr. Permit, show the influence of external pressures on a collapsible tubing. So in this case, if we have a tube that has the potential for collapsing, we want to look at the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. Without that area of collapse, these are the two pressures that would determine the gradient across the tubing. However, if there were an external pressure compressing the elastic tubing, then the flow through the tubing no longer is determined by the downstream pressure, but actually this extrinsic pressure. 
So this is similar to a waterfall. You see the water at the top of the waterfall is flowing at a rate that is determined by the altitude gradient from somewhere upstream to right at the cliff of the waterfall. The rate of water flow has absolutely nothing to do with the height of the waterfall. And that's why the downstream pressure has no effect on the flow rate at the top of the waterfall. Let's extrapolate that same principle when we're thinking about pulmonary vasculature. The upstream pressure now is the pulmonary arterial pressure. The downstream pressure is the pulmonary venous pressure. And in between is the pulmonary capillary that's exposed to the pressure of the alveolus. So when the alveolar pressure is low and there's no compression of the pulmonary capillary, blood flow through the vessel is determined by the pulmonary arterial pressure and the pulmonary venous pressure. But if the pressure of the alveolus is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure, you'll actually see collapse of the pulmonary capillary. In this case, pulmonary venous pressure is no longer important in the blood flow through that pulmonary capillary. Blood flow is now determined by the pulmonary arterial pressure and the alveolar pressure. And the final concept that you need to understand the zones of the lung is gravity. The influence of gravity is different on pulmonary blood flow and pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary blood flow increases as we move down the lung at a rate of about one centimeter of water per one centimeter of height. So you can see in the cartoon that in the apices of the lung, there's less blood flow than at the bases of the lung. Ventilation in the lung is similarly greater at the base of the lung than at the apex. This is an important concept. While at baseline, air rises, the alveoli at the apices are more distended than the alveoli at the bases. But when you're talking about ventilation, it's the amount of air that's moving with each breath. And in this case, alveoli at the apices, which are already distended, have very little additional distensibility whereas the alveoli at the bases have a great potential for distensibility, and therefore there's more ventilation at the bases than at the apices. The rate of increase in ventilation as you move down the lung, however, is less than the perfusion. Ventilation increases at a rate of about 0.5 centimeters of water for every centimeter of height that we move down the lung. So therefore, pulmonary blood flow and ventilation are both increasing as we move down the lung, but at different rates. And so there are going to be areas of the lung where pulmonary blood flow matches ventilation. We call that areas of VQ matching. And there's going to be areas where there is an excess of pulmonary blood flow or ventilation as they relate to each other. We call these areas VQ mismatched, and these are normal physiologic VQ mismatching that occurs in the lung due to gravity. And here's where we're going to sum up all four of those concepts into understanding the zones of the lung. In zone one, we see that alveoli are naturally distended, and they exert a pressure on the blood vessels to the extent that the blood vessels are collapsed. So in mathematical terms, we see that the alveolar pressure is greater than the pulmonary arterial pressure, which is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure. We're gonna notice the pulmonary artery pressure is always gonna be greater than the pulmonary venous pressure. In zone two, which is the waterfall zone, there's going to be flow limitation due to the alveolar pressure that's exerted. So the alveolar pressure is causing collapse of the blood vessel, but not completely. In this case, 
pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than the alveolar pressure, which is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure. You'll see the radius of the capillary is reduced, meaning blood flow is reduced. And the determinant of blood flow then becomes the difference between the pulmonary arterial pressure and the alveolar pressure. Zone three is where the alveolar pressure is minimal compared to the pressures in the blood vessel. So the pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure, which are both greater than the alveolar pressure. In this case, there is no compression of the blood vessel from the alveolus, and the blood flow through the blood vessels is purely determined by the pulmonary arterial pressure and the pulmonary venous pressure. Zone four is the extra zone. It's a bonus concept for you uh, if you'd like to understand. Zone four doesn't follow uh, the same pattern as zones one, two, and three. In zones four, you have an interstitial pressure from the interstitium of the lung that's actually collapsing the blood vessels. So it, the interplay between the pulmonary arterial pressure, pulmonary venous pressure, and alveolar pressure no longer exists, and blood flow is decreased purely because interstitial pressure is collapsing the blood vessel. You see this in areas of atelectasis. And those are the basic four zones of the lung. So that seems easy enough, right? So all we have to do now is apply those concepts that we learned for the zones of the lung as they relate to patients in different conditions. For example, what happens to the zones of the lung if the patient changes position from upright to supine? Well, gravity still exists, we know that, but the effect over the lung is distributed differently. Instead of thinking of the gradient of gravity from the apex to the bases, we're now thinking of the gradient from the anterior portions of the lung to the posterior portions of the lung. With that position change from upright to supine, we also have an increase in blood flow to the central circulation as blood flow to the legs decrease. Overall, this results in a shift from areas of zone one to zone two and zone two to zone three, and there's improvement in the VQ matching within the lung. Here's another situation. What happens to the zones of the lung if the patient becomes hypovolemic? In this case, cardiac output and therefore blood flow would decrease. And as a result, areas of zone two would shift to zone one and zone three would shift to zone two because there would be less pressure within the blood vessels. This would result in worsening of the VQ matching within the lung. And one more case. What would happen if a patient suffers a C5-C6 spinal cord injury? In this case, the patient is still spontaneously breathing. You remember the phrenic nerve is supplied by C3, 4, and 5, that keeps the diaphragm alive. An injury to C5 and C6, though, would affect the accessory muscles to the respiratory system and therefore decrease the ability of the patient to take a deep breath. Lung volumes would decrease, resulting in more atelectasis within the lung, and there would be lower tidal volumes and lower ventilation, and alveolar pressure would decrease. In terms of what would happen with the zones of the lung, there would be an anatomic shift of the zones with less areas of zone one and more areas of zone two and three because of that decrease in alveolar pressure. And there would be more areas of zone four with complete atelectasis and compression of the blood vessels due to that lung compression. VQ ratios decrease with less ventilation. So these are some scenarios where you can use what is happening to the patient to describe how the zones of the lung will change. So what I hope to describe to you were those zones of the lung, how they can be described by the four simple concepts that we learned in physics, Ohm's law, Poiseuille's law, the Starling resistor, and gravity 
and I hope moving forward you can use these concepts to describe patient physiology and how they affect the zones of the lung. Thank you.